<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Shirley Marciniak, Senior Career Services Consultant, uh, the Cur uh, Center for Career Opportunities for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, March 18, 2009 in Stewart Center in the television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Good afternoon, Shirley. Thank, and thank you. Thank you. Okay, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Well, I was born in Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada. And uh, in fact, my entire family, my mother and father, were both born in Canada, but came from England. Uh, their families came from England, and my mother was back in England during World War I because her father was, was part of the English forces at that time. I have one sister. Um, we came to the States when I was about five years old, and our first destination was Lincoln, Illinois. Where? Lincoln, Illinois. And from there, we went to Minnesota. So most of my growing up years were in Minnesota. Okay. Tell us about your early years in grade school and then uh, high school. I think I was a normal grade school, high school student. I always loved school. Uh, I loved activities. Since my father had been an only child and he was a hunter and a fisherman and all those kinds of activities, but he had two daughters, but he was, I think, ahead of his time and he allowed his daughters to do many of the things that you would only find young men doing at that time or, or boys. And so I hunted and fished with my father and fished the trout streams and the Rocky Mountains. And so my growing up years were wonderful years. Right. Lived in a small town, Cloquet, Minnesota, of about 8,000. And an outstanding uh, educational system. And I was in the choir and the band, and the band traveled to Canada and to the World Fair. And um, I had a lot of, of opportunities, I think, partly because of the size of the town. and and knew a lot of people and was very involved. So what was I the, loved my school years. Yeah. What was the uh, size of the year of your class? What was the size of the school? The size of my class was about probably 130. So it wasn't a real large school, but you knew everybody sure. and uh, it was times you could walk to things and participate and I was involved in a lot of activities and just enjoyed my right. school years, have very, very fond memories of both my elementary and my high school Good. years. And then what came next? What came, did you go to college? I went to college. Whereabouts? And I started college at a private girls' school in Milwaukee called Milwaukee Downer. And then Milwaukee Downer was sold and it became part of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And the faculty went to Appleton uh, to um, Carleton College, I believe. I, I can't remember, but one of them. And I went back home and went to the University of Minnesota. So my degree is from the University of Minnesota. Okay. Well, tell us about college life, your activities and the professors and what campus life was like. Uh, Did you, you lived on campus? I lived on campus. Uh, I, one thing I remember about college, it was the year that John Kennedy was killed and I was at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis and I remember I was standing on the steps ready to go to a liberal arts or to a uh, English class, English literature class and that announcement came uh, over the air that John Kennedy had been shot and I think that affected my college years. It um, brought me maybe to the responsibilities of adulthood a little faster until that time. Everything had been good and fine and perfect and I, I just didn't think about um, political other things. things that would be happening in society. And I think our whole generation was affected. The fact that we can remember exactly where we were and I remember the days after that. I was involved in normal college activities, uh, got my degree, a yeah, Bachelor of Science in Social Science Education, uh, completed in about three and a half years, and I remember that I completed my degree on a Friday and started teaching full-time the following Monday in uh, a 12th grade social science class. Right, in the but same I town? But I my college yeah. years. Where were you teaching then? I was teaching in Two Harbors, Minnesota, Okay. and I taught there for three years and then I went to Duluth, Minnesota and taught there before I got married and then we came to uh, 
Purdue. Okay. Tell, and then how did you happen to come to Purdue then? Because my, your husband uh, was... My okay. husband was uh, received a call from Purdue University and said, would he be interested to come and interview for a position here? At that time, he was on the staff of the University of Minnesota in Duluth. And uh, we had a new baby, three months old, and he, we hadn't had any summer vacation. And he said he would come and look at the position. And What was the position? What, what? It was for a position at the recreational sports Okay, area. And, and the co so no, in the co rec? The co rec, the okay. old co rec. And we came for three years. And he just retired 37 years later. <laughs> and Purdue has been wonderful. And I joined the staff at Purdue in 1980. I worked part-time. I think I joined the Career Center in 1982. Okay. When you, what year did you come then to Purdue? And what was the housing? And tell us a little about when you first came. Well, when we first came to Purdue, school was about ready to start. And there wasn't all the housing this is in the fall, today then. in the fall. And my husband came, and finding an apartment was not easy or a place to live. And I stayed home. We had a home to sell. So I stayed in Duluth until he found a place for us to live and to get started. And, and uh, things were very different than they are now. The size of the university was What's, what year did you What year did you come with? You came with him? The 70s, maybe? 19, trying to think, 1970, mm -hmm. okay. the fall of 1970. But uh, where about then you got it was a, Purdue was smaller than the university I'd attended. University of Minnesota was much larger, but it was still a large university. And the rec sports um, area was one of the tops in the country at that time. Very few colleges had a facility just devoted to the intramurals and recreational activity, and so that was very intriguing for him mm -hmm. to be part of that. What was his position there? He was assistant director okay. when he started there. Yeah. Now you have what, one child? Do you have another child? How many children? We have two children, a okay. son and a daughter. Did one is a Purdue graduate and one is an IU graduate. Okay. So. Uh, what, and what are they doing now? <clears throat> I have a daughter that is teaching in Indianapolis at a science and math magnet school, elementary school, and she is married and has two children. And I have a son, and his family live in the Keys of Florida, and he is a district manager for Budweiser down there. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> nice, warm, good place to visit. <laughs> right. Well, let's talk a little about the Center for Career Opportunities. And, of course, what was your initial appointment? And tell us a little bit about that. Well, my Maybe. initial start in the Career Center was part of the support staff. They had had someone that had to leave for illness, and at that time I was working for Purdue in uh, just on a part-time basis. And so I took that position. They had a front counter there where students came in and asked questions, etc. And since I had been a teacher and a 12th grade teacher, uh, Dick Stewart thought I would be just excellent for working with the students. But it was a support position, a clerical position. And so that's where I started in the Career Center. And uh, it fit my hours because I didn't want to come to work till after my children got on the school bus. And I needed to be home by the time they got off the school bus. I had been staying at home with them prior to they started school. Right. So I did that for a little while. And then I had talked with him about a full-time or not a full-time, I wanted a part-time position, but I would have liked to have been part of his administrative staff. And he didn't have anything available, and about that time the School of Management was looking for an academic advisor 20 hours a week. And I interviewed and I took that position. So I spent some time as an academic advisor over in uh, the Cranert School of Undergraduate Program and Management. And one day Dick called and he said, Shirley, I have a position. Are you interested in coming to talk to me? And I did. And so I was Purdue's first, as I understand it, non-academic uh, schedule a professional administrative staff employee. I worked from the end of August up until May, and then I had my summers off. Sounds and like a good schedule. <laughs> it was a wonderful schedule. And Dick and I had an agreement that when my, I felt my children were old enough, if he needed me, I would work full time. And so one day he called me in and he said, I need to have this position full time. David was my youngest child. He said, do you think David is uh, 
is enough on his own and David had graduated from college so I had no excuses and I went to work full time in the, the career okay. center. What, and then what were your response? Well, how did the position change then? From well, when? <clears throat> my position when I, when I came back from, from management, print. I had been working with employers. I had been doing uh, career counseling with students. I had kind of a combination of appointment. And uh, that's really the role that I stayed in. I just did it longer hours. And uh, oh, after I went full time, I worked a lot with employers. And then he promoted me to associate director for employer relations. So I s oversaw all the employer relations for the staff. What well, tells what that entailed? The employer relations for the researchers of the end. That that <coughs> entailed the um, responsibility for seeing that employers coming to campus, and I had staff that worked with me, but that employers coming to campus, that their interview schedules were set up, that students they received student resumes and signed up for interviews, the interviewing activity of the office. It included recruiting. Um, different organizations to come to campus to interview. I did a little traveling with that to visit employers to try to uh, add employers to the, to the staff. In addition to that, I got involved in the technology and the development of some of our online recruiting I was going to ask you about that. That made a big, big impact on it. Big impact. Right. And, and Purdue was really on the forefront of that. They developed their own with the help of uh, what was the technology area here at Purdue in the 1980s. We developed the first online scheduling system for employers. And one of the things that drove that, and I think this is unique of, of the Career Center, uh, students are our first um, area that we're interested in. Serving our students is primary. Sure. We've always felt that we were part of the educational mission of the university, that we educated students on uh, job search techniques, helping them decide what they wanted to do, career development. Our other clients or stakeholders, another big group, were the employing organizations. And they work in a very different environment than the educational environment. So we found that they often drove us to develop programs, et cetera, that would help meet their needs. And that's really part of what drove coming uh, online for yeah. scheduling interviews, because yeah. that would be easier for employers. They could review the resumes right in their own office electronically. Uh, students could submit resumes to them very easily. You weren't having to package those resumes and mail them, and it gave students more access to a greater variety of employers. But it was probably initially driven by employers who wanted those kinds of capabilities. And back in the days before that, remember they used to have the long lines, and then they'd have to come in and uh, for researchers that, and they'd sit out. They'd get up there what the day before just to get That's their right. name. That's right. They'd sleep in the hallways overnight, and we'd come in, and they would be have their sleeping bags out in the hallways and their pizza boxes. And, <laughs> I and, remember uh, that. But the, the one I want, just want to mention for the researchers in a little history, Good. the one thing about that is students could really see what the market was like and what their competition is. Because they were lined up in the hallways, and they had to select one uh, one organization to sign up first with, the, what was their first choice, and then they had to get in line to uh, another line for the next book to sign up for another employer. And so they could really see the competition. Today, with it all being online, etc., students don't see what their competition is or who's applying to that organization. Right. So there's been a positive, we wouldn't go back to that. And also students, many students who might not have come into the office came into the office and got to know us and interact with us. So with every uh, technology, I think, you lose a little sure. and you gain a whole lot. That's and right. and yeah. we did. And originally when we came online, students filled out bubble sheets. And then we processed those bubble sheets. and. Uh, 
those were run electronically to schedule their interviews. That was the step prior to them actually signing up online and yeah. filled up. So it was a progression into the technology. Right. What about the impact on the, the job fairs? How do you do you CEO, uh, CCO organize job fairs and the other academic departments also? have similar things, like engineering runs one, don't they? That is correct. <clears throat> okay. Purdue probably has more job fairs than any other campus in the, in the United States, I would guess. Including think, a just-in-time, don't you? Including the just-in-time. But most of them are organized by other student organizations or academic departments. We organize what's called Pharmacy Days for Pharmacy Students. We organize the just-in-time job fair, which is held at the end of the academic year. That was started maybe three or four years ago because employers would get late requ requisitions for to hire, and by then most of the job fairs were over, and so we instituted that so that they would have access and students that were still looking would have access. We do a teacher recruitment day, and we do a campus, um, uh, not campus, but a camp right. career day. Right. Other than that, the rest are organized by student right. organizations. We did bring all the groups that put camp fair or put, put uh, career fairs together. We. Uh, discuss the number of career fairs that there were. Uh, all the participants that sponsor a career fair came to this meeting. And one of the things for employers or employing organization was which career fairs should we come to? Uh, Purdue has so many, we have limited dollars. And so in that meeting, a pamphlet was designed and put together that could be distributed to employing organizations with a summary of each of the different career fairs that were offered so that it gave them a guide in their recruiting. And it was a tremendous collaboration. Although they're sponsored by different groups, now we have one piece of literature that employers can see online or we can send to them in hard copy to help their recruiting efforts at Purdue. Right. Uh, <clears throat> what about the impact? You've gone through peaks and valleys as far as the economy and certainly now. How does that impact and how do you work through that? It's a challenge, isn't it? It is a real challenge. Right. It is a real challenge and we've gone through those periods in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and Enough. of course currently. Right. Uh, it's a challenge for our students. It is a challenge for the employing organizations because at a time when they are having to lay off people that are currently employed with them, it makes it very difficult for them to bring in yeah. new hires right. or even interns. And many times we see that we have students that think they have an offer or are going to have an offer and the economy turns pretty suddenly as it has this time and those dissolve, then we have to be ready. And we usually see some of this coming, so we begin to position new ways to help our students and to let them know we're there to help them. We try to find those organizations that have positions and guide students to that. Um, a lot of it is supporting the students that there are opportunities and there's always opportunities out there some areas more than others right. at a time like this. Um, but it is a difficult time and we are affected greatly by what happens in the economy or in an area. Uh, when the dot-coms went bust, that affected a lot of our students. And it's not only our students but our alumni. Right. We start getting calls from alumni that uh, have lost their jobs and we try to help them and we're strategizing now about new techniques students might have or how to identify those organizations. For those students that might have had offers and companies maybe through no fault of their own have had to withdraw those and that has happened in all these cases, we try to negotiate with those organizations so that those students are given 
some funding uh, to help them either find a new position or cover any costs that they've invested. Right. But, uh, Do you think that just in time might help a little bit? Uh, it's hard to tell though this year. It's hard to tell right? because obviously the number of employers that Right. are looking are down but right. we're hoping that that's going to right. help and, and we're working with students but I think it's at a time like that that students really need to network they always need to network but when the economy isn't as strong that networking becomes even more important right. you mentioned the alumni have you always had access uh, have the alumni sort of come to you uh, in the past or is there and if so is there more of a change more of an increase using your service We've always had services for alumni, okay. and currently at Purdue and in the past, there have been no charges for those services. And that is unusual. Right. Most schools have a fee. And in, alumni have always come to us and worked with us, but when the economy goes south, we start hearing from more alumni. Sure. And uh, we can write what's called letters of reciprocity if they're in an area where there are other colleges and universities. We contact those career centers and ask if they will extend whatever they extend to their alumni to ours and we will do the same. So there's, there's those kinds of things. We can work in conjunction with the alumni service here at Purdue and the alumni clubs around the country. Those are good groups for students to net or alumni to network with sure. and finding jobs. We critique resumes online because they'll say, I haven't done a resume in years and send it to us or I need to update my resume. And, but they, we extend services if they're near campus. They can interview on campus. They can come to the career fairs. Uh, Do you think they hard. also touch base with their departments as well in addition? I it's would, hard. I think so. They, because I, I've been out uh, 10 years and this was my major in XYZ mm -hmm. and, and they might have some lead, they might also be another source too because maybe you want to come back to school and you look at, you've been out so long, mm -hmm. these are some things that you're going to have to take in order to be, you know, in order that's to enroll. Right. And that's where <coughs> the career development area of our office comes in. They talk might, a little about that. Yeah. They might sit down and talk with one of our career consultants about what they uh, are interested in and, and is adding an additional degree at this time something that they really want to do or do they want to move in a different direction. Uh, so that's another one of our services that would be available to them. Is that pretty much what you do? I was going to ask what your job title is. When is that I, the senior career? Now I'm, I, at, when I went part time, because I'm getting ready to retire here, so I'm only working, I'm back to 20 hours a week. I became a uh, senior career services consultant, but what I'm really doing is training staff to do, take over some of the things that I had been doing. Good. And also we were short an employer, what we call an employer coordinator, and since I used to oversee that, this year I've been working with employers in terms of their interviewing. And, but I have been overseeing our post-graduation status, which is, uh, our May graduates and where they go and what kinds of jobs or are they continuing education and our office is charged by the university to maintain those statistics and figures so I have done that for the last I don't know how many years and I'm <laughs> currently training someone to take that's that key over. everybody wants stats you know the that's, kind of thing that's too. metrics there it's you all go about metrics. that's right <laughs> and we um, I have to throw this in Last year, 90, we, we had responses from 90% of the May 2008 bachelor's graduates. Very good. In terms of, if you want to call them placement kinds of statistics. So we work really hard, and there, there yeah. isn't another school in the country. You got you. It seems to me also you've been increasing some drop-ins in addition to the resume, and you've been doing the mm -hmm. camps and things. Those are or those have been going on what, for a couple mm -hmm. of years. They're, they look like are pretty successful. We no. do. We've always had some kind of walk-in program, right. but we're promoting that more than ever. We go. I don't know how many classes we go and speak in and talk about uh, career-related things or writing resumes to student organizations, to evening programs, to collaborating in the community. Uh, we have a large outreach 
in terms of our services. You're right. Uh, the students, do they help with the resumes? Is that something? Then they probably one-on-one. -on -one. We have a program called the Student Ambassador Program okay. is probably what you're referring to. And we hire 10 students to be part of this. We, they have to apply and interview for those positions. Then they are trained so that they can critique student resumes. And as they grow with us or stay with us a couple of years, they may go out and do presentations. Uh, they organize programs. One just organized something called an etiquette dinner. A what? Etiquette dinner. And this was a dinner where students, sponsored by employers, again, it's the partnership with the employers that are key, and the employers can attend those sponsoring employers and sit with a table of eight to ten students, and they have a dinner, and we bring in someone to talk about uh, etiquette at meals, because many times in their careers or as they're interviewing, students are invited to go out with employers and they don't always know the proper etiquette. And that was arranged by one of our student ambassadors this year. And uh, How did it go over pretty well? Very well. And the employers come and join in that and then they're networking with students they may want to hire and the employers enjoy it. Yeah, that's and a good it's idea. A, it's a great problem. <laughs> but they, our student ambassadors have organized different types of programs for students. And uh, it also allows us to mentor individual student ambassadors. And we hope some of them will find that career services is where they want to be. Sounds good. And stay in the profession. Right. You had, you, uh, when you started with, Dick Stewart was ahead and now uh, Tim. So you worked under the two of them. I've worked under both of them. Right. And they each have probably different changes or things that they brought in? Yes. Uh -huh. um, I couldn't have had two better people to work for. Dick Stewart was the first fellow in the National Association of Colleges and Employers, the first college person to be um, nominated and uh, awarded into the Fellowship um, Hall of Fame for the profession. He Purdue has been very for, he was one of a National Association of Colleges and Employers president. Tim has been a National Association of Colleges and Employers president. And so Purdue has been on the cutting and leading edge of the profession. And uh, having that kind of leadership in the national organization, certainly Purdue really benefits from yeah. that. And they've both had uh, leading roles. They both have been, uh, from my perspective, they assigned you something to do or gave you a project or an area to work in, most supportive, but were willing to uh, look at new ideas. Uh, Dick Stewart was a wonderful mentor to me and uh, opened a lot of doors nationally in the profession for me and in the Midwest Association of Colleges Employers. I knew Tim 15 years before he came to Purdue and had worked with him on committees, et cetera, in uh, the professional organizations. Sure. So uh, we've been very fortunate at Purdue to have outstanding right. leadership. Yeah. Are you still active in, the, you're still active in the profession, too, as well? Do you go to some of the national meetings? I do. Okay. I have been to the national meetings. I've been a presenter. I have um, been on committees at the national level, at our regional level. I have led two conferences, I've chaired two conferences for them that were held in Indianapolis with over 500 attendees. Um, very good. I've been very fortunate. Very to, good, right. <coughs> that I've loved it. Yeah. The teacher recruitment, uh, why do you only have it at, uh, only once a year? Is that mm -hmm. correct in the spring? For researchers, I'm thinking, why wouldn't you have it twice a year, maybe? Okay. It's built around when the students the, are free from their student teaching. The education students have to do student teaching, mm -hmm. and so they're usually off campus. It is also chosen to do at that time because that's when most employers are ready to hire. And so that's why it's held in the spring rather than twice a year. For positions that are open mid-year, and students that might be graduating in mid-year, employers can either come to campus to interview, 
uh, outside of teacher recruitment day or they can post their positions so the students do have access or alumni to any openings. But teacher recruitment day usually across the country and in within the state of Indiana are held in the spring because it times with the I students' see. academic sure. curriculum. Sure, okay. Um, you, and you talked about our, and then of course, um, you used to have the Career Resource Center and that merged with CCO. Mm -hmm. uh, for researchers that, just make a comment on that, what, about the, why that merger, what the other center was. Okay, the <coughs> other center worked a lot with career development, testing of students, interest testing, that kind of area. And to have a comprehensive career center, it makes sense, and this is true at many universities, to have that incorporated in a and we became the Center for Career Opportunities before that was done, so students have one-stop shopping. They can come in as freshmen and explore career ideas, areas, uh, receive that career counseling. They can look for internships and hopefully grow right from their freshman year through their senior year, and then we can help launch them uh, in those to careers. the next step. Do you uh, work with uh, students that want internships, or do more of the academic? How does that work? That is for the paid internships, and cetera. Most of that will come through us because employers will interview for interns at the same time they're looking often for full-time hires or come back. For internships with credit, those come through the academic okay, areas okay. because only they That's can That's a good point. That. Okay. Right. Um, you have some notes there, and I'll let you talk any more about the department if you like. <clears throat> And you talked about the, uh, uh, one, a couple of the online tools, let me ask, the CCO Express and that uh, NACE link for okay. the research to share, to comment on those. Right. Uh, we've had about five different online programs I referred to in the 80s. We developed our own. And then you had some commercial entities getting into it, and they would come and talk to us, and we were ahead of them. And so we shared with many of them the things we were doing, and then they because we were trying to support it with a programmer, <laughs> and they had multiple programmers, we then went with uh, a commercial product, and Purdue often did advising with that commercial product. Then back, oh, maybe five years ago, the, our professional organization partnered with a uh, gentleman and, uh, that had a group called Direct Employers to develop a online system, and uh, Purdue was one of the schools that helped develop that. In fact, I was a representative to that national committee that developed what at that time was called NACE Link, NACE being our professional organization. And each college that was part of that named their online program for something in their school, and we named it CCO Express. Mm -hmm. And it was very ro robust program. Uh, again, uh, that then was changed over to a consortium of the National Association of Colleges, Employers, Direct Employers, and a company called Simplicity. And that is the current program we're using today. And it's a very robust program compared to what we had in the 80s. It, we're moving it up. allows employers, for instance, to uh, we can send employers resumes and from those uh, what we send them in the files or they can get them right online they can email students they can manage all their campus recruiting from the three four hundred schools that belong through one tool it gives our students access to job listings if the employers have chosen Purdue as well as other colleges it has just expanded our sounds comprehensive very comprehensive yeah. Very, Very good. good. Yeah. But it just gives students a whole lot of opportunities and alumni. Our alumni are part of that. Do the alumni have to register with you? They register with us online. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everything, I know, I know. Everything's <laughs> online, which makes it convenient for them. <laughs> now, the uh, CCO got some awards. One is that Kaplan, the unofficial, unbiased readers. I think that CCO got that award and also that Chevron Award. Yeah. The Chevron Award yeah. is a national award uh, given by the National Association of Colleges and Employers. And we received that award for videos that we created 
so that students that were unable to attend some of the workshops that we do on resume writing and uh, tips on attending a career fair, interviewing, negotiation, they can see them online. And back when those were developed, they were the first time that had been done. And the stars of those videos were our students and our employing organizations. And each video is maybe 10 to 12, 15 minutes. And so that put it, again, both students and alumni's hands, those workshops that they maybe were unable to attend. Sure. And that we were given the Chevron Award for that. That broadens the area where the scope in which you can touch base with the Reach. people that are interested mm -hmm. in your, and what your services are. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> Uh, any awards and honors that uh, did you want like to share that you received? <laughs> My awards and honors have been again tied to the professional organizations. Uh, the Midwest Professional Midwest Colleges uh, Association of Colleges and Employers uh, gave me the J.W. Paquette Outstanding Leadership Award, and. Uh, was it a surprise? It, well, it was supposed to be a surprise. <laughs> I usually ask people how they, I get different reactions. Go ahead. <laughs> they tried to get me to that uh, association meeting that year, and I was in the process of developing the NACELINK program. Nationally, I was on that committee, and we were the first school to roll that out, and the programmers were still developing, and it was at the time of when I was to get the Paquette Award. And I, I was not aware that I was to get it, and I went into Tim and said, I cannot go to that conference because we're rolling this out. We're the first school. I need to be here to work with programmers who were in Indianapolis, and I was working with them online at night because we were going into recruit. So I didn't go to the conference. <laughs> you ended and they up had it all arranged. So then they tried again to surprise me at the midwinter conference and something came up and I said, Tim, I just, I have to be here. I just can't go. So the following spring they decided they needed to tell me about it <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me the award. But it was just as special. But, uh, and then um, I was last year and it was to be a surprise and uh, they finally had to tell me I received the CDPI award for um, leadership, senior distinguished leadership, and that's the uh, Indiana professional organization. Very good. And so that was nice. And then I chaired ABSAC here at Purdue and was given, well, not really an award, but an award for being chair of ABSAC. I think I chaired that the fifth year that ABSAC was Part of the Very good. professional advisory committee. Sure. So. That's nice. And uh, now let's talk a little bit about uh, what's your favorite Purdue tradition and outstanding event. Um, I love the Purdue hymn. And I was, I think, at one of the first places the Purdue hymn was sung. Brian Breed, when he was here, had discovered the Purdue hymn and, and did it at a program. And every time the Purdue hymn is kind of special. Song. It is really right, special. Yeah. Have you been involved at all in any committees on campus too as well? Or? Primarily ABSAC okay. was, is the major committee and then I've served on committees within student services uh, that have. I've served on the technology committee in some sure. of those, Good. those groups. How about your outstanding event? What do you think about that? You got one? At Purdue or just at in any my place, life? Any place. Well, I'm a naturalized citizen of the uh, United States, and my parents had to study and take exams before you can get your citizenship, and they did that before I turned 16. And so I remember going before the judge with my flag in my hand and becoming a naturalized citizen of the United States. And so to me, citizenship of any country implies privilege and obligation. And I think sometimes when you're born in a country, rather than watching your parents study to and make a conscious decision to change their citizenship, you maybe don't think about it that way. That's right. And so to me, 
uh, being a citizen of the United States or any country left a real mark of the privilege right. and obligation. My second would be having the privilege of working in an educational environment with students. It's just been a, a passion and I just feel blessed that. Good. Now, in, any closing comments or something that you'd like to say and how it maybe changes or you look as you look ahead? And that's all, what are your plans for retirement? <laughs> uh, They're still in the planning stage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As I look ahead, um, I'd like to go back to school and take some courses that when you're studying for your degrees, you take what you have to. You don't get to take as many electives. I'd like to take an art history course. I would like to be involved in some way with students, to continue to be involved with students. Um, I started as a high school teacher, and students in education are very important to me right. in continuing my education in whatever realm expanding I think it uh, it's for me the key to happiness right. to do those kinds of things and um, then I enjoy my my family and grandchildren. And you can, can you stay in the community? F probably right. for a while. Okay. We'll stay in the community. It's been a wonderful community. Purdue University, um, we're so fortunate. I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunity to, to work here, and um, it's a special place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirley. This concludes it. Thank you very much. <laughs>